proposition. They both both parties are war parties, where so the Democrats were willing to say go out and, and fight against Trump, but they don't seem to be so willing anymore because now Trump has adopted this war policy. So I think we have to look for these tactics and we have to get out in the streets so people see us, so they can join us, because it is that people power that is the only thing that's going to um, help us win, and that's, now's the time to do that. Thank you, Joe. Oh, a couple of things to reply to. There's one on Korea. Do you want to? Um, you know, Reverend Kim didn't show you these photos from some protests that happened yesterday in Song Jersey. But, um, you know, after the... Um, louder, louder. Oh, so after the president was impeached, the question for the, the left or the people who organized the movement was, what next? And... The challenge was to really shift the focus of that movement and break them to Sangju to help in the fight against that. Um, and in a very small amount of time, the people who start who have started to shift and uh, go to Sangju uh, to stand in solidarity with the protesters. And just yesterday, uh, they had 10,000 people uh, in a small village of only 200 people. Um, it's not the millions that also part, but it's starting to shift. So that's a very positive sign. Um, you know, the, the technical grounds for which Park Geun-hye was uh, impeached uh, was the political corruption that everybody else now knows about the scandal involving the... Um, her, her confidant, and she was embezzling money from corporations using her connection to the president, etc. But what uh, the Western media doesn't talk about is that the mass movement that actually removed Park, um, that had to do with pent up anger among the people that was building uh, for the past four years um, because of uh, Park's uh, very autocratic rule. Um, you know, when she was elected president in December of 2012, um, the, the overwhelming pe uh, feeling among progressives in South Korea was just one of utter despair. Um, and she quickly introduced neo-authoritarian rule. She is the daughter of a dictator, and many people commented that what she was doing was very reminiscent of her father's dictatorship era in the 60s and 70s. The first thing that she did was jail an opposition lawmaker on completely erroneous charges that he was an agent of North Korea. This is a very tried and true tactic of the, the ruling party in, in South Korea. They also dissolved the Unified Progressive Party, which is um, a, a grassroots united front uh, party of workers, farmers, and the urban poor um, that was dissolved uh, forcefully by the uh, Park Geun-hye administration. They also cracked down on labor unions and I do believe that that type of state repression uh, is uh, um, is not out of uh, the um, the uh, realm of possibility in terms of what we might face under the Trump administration uh, in the near future. Um, in South Korea, the left was too fractured at that moment uh, to really withstand those uh, those uh, the onslaught of repression. So in the beginning, there was complete fear and silence among the left. Um, even when the party was dissolved, uh, other uh, progressives of the unions stayed silent. Um, but, um, and, 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 and I think that was because that type of repression South Korea hadn't seen in about two decades. Um, so the older generation of activists knew uh, about that kind of um, uh, 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 state repression, but the younger generation hadn't, hadn't seen that. Um, but as we know from history, repression always creates resistance, and um, slowly, uh, you know, the, the different pockets of people started to really um, uh, to resist. And, and I think that the tragedy of the really remember the ferry that sank with like hundreds of school children on board. Um, the parents of, of those uh, children started to demand a full investigation and an explanation, justice, and accountability from the government. Uh, and and the, the president just chose to, um, uh, to um, silence and to block any independent investigation. And they really had the sympathy of the entire nation, and they really 
pressed and, and created an opening for progressives to, to start pressing on other issues. And then the labor market reform initiatives that were going to completely make the um, labor market flexible um, and then crack down on labor unions, um, that really uh, energized the, the labor movement in Korea. Um, and the KC, the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, uh, there was an election and there was a young president who won the KCT, the, the labor union election, um, on the platform that he was going to organize a general strike to stand up against Park and his authoritarian rule. And uh, that had, hadn't happened in decades uh, in KCT history. Um, it was, uh, the leadership was very much sort of the bureaucratic leadership. He sort of came from nowhere. Uh, uh, and uh, he had a very energetic uh, campaign and the majority of the KCT rank and file supported it. Um, and so that's basically what he did in 2015 was build a broad united front with farmers and the urban poor um, at various levels. So not at just at the national level, but at, at, at each district, local district, they had coalitions of farmers, civic groups, women's groups, youth groups, uh, they organized labor coming together uh, in coalitions. And that bottom-up movement is what led to, culminated in the mass protests that happened in 2016 that actually got that president of the KCT in jail. He's still in jail today. Um, and you'll remember that was also the protest where the farmer activist was shot by a water cannon and then he was hospitalized for a year uh, before he passed away. So that had happened just a year before the, the, the recent mass protests. And then in in the fall of 2016 is when all of the corruption scandal and all that uh, was um, exposed in the media, and there were some spontaneous protests against Park Geun-hye at that time. But it was, you know, these calls for impeachment of Park Geun-hye were very small. It was on the anniversary of the mass protest led by organized labor, the Broad United Front, in November. That that was the first time that millions of people came out to the streets. So, you know, it was not, the, the, the Western media likes to portray it as like, oh, it was just spontaneous protest, everybody's angry about some, you know, corruption scandal with the, you know, with the shaman cult-like leader, you know, <laughs> all of that, right? But actually, what happened was it was a conscious organizing led by organized labor in a united front that kind of pushed the mass movement to millions on the streets uh, that now culminated to the impeachment of the president. Um, so I feel like we can draw lessons from that in this country that we need to, you know, because we are now in a very different moment also. Everybody's on the move in this country. Like racial justice movements and environmental justice movements and people are, it's, you know, people there. I do believe that there will be a broad anti-Trump uh, united front that does come together in some shape or form. And I think that, you know, we as the anti-war movement need to keep pushing in terms of, um, uh, you know, making linkages and coordinating with other other sectors of the, of the movement. The last thing I will just say, sorry. No, it's fine, it's fine. last thing is that um, the one lesson to draw from Korea is that, so, you know, this whole mass movement, uh, you know, impeach the president, but now what's going to happen is that they basically handed the presidency over to a liberal Democrat, right? Um, uh, and he, he doesn't necessarily represent the interests of the masses of people who came out onto the street. Um, so, you know, as we build a united front, a broad united front against Trump, you know, obviously our aim is not to hand it over to the liberal Democrats. Um, so we need to also be conscious that we need to be doing the long-term uh, you know, building uh, of alternative uh, parties, institutions, alternative ways of building political power. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, we have Mary Beth and Rick have some comments before we run out of time. Did you have another question? I just have one, one question and one thing to say. Um, right now we're in a very exciting time because the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty is in front of the United Nations. and. Um, there on June 19th, <coughs> it will 
be three more weeks of um, discussion and negotiation for a nuclear weapons ban treaty for the whole world. Um, there's going to be Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is um, organizing a women's march to ban the bomb on June 17th, which is a Saturday, at, in New York City, uh, going to the United Nations, and anybody who can be there is invited, but also we're asking people to do like what happened on January 21st um, and have a uh, have marches all over the country to ban the bomb and raise consciousness. And my question is, I heard that North Korea actually was in favor of a nuclear weapons ban treaty. Is, is this true? It, it voted in favor, yes. Well, uh, no other nuclear nation did. Uh, although you've got 100, over 130 non-nuclear nations ready to bomb the ban, and we should be following their lead. Let, let's let's get to final comments, Mary Beth. If you wanted to say something, and then Reese, we got a few minutes left. I just want to um, just express my gratitude for um, the global network, everyone, um, and this community of people. I mean, it's it's quite um, a gift to be present to, to this community of activists, given the knowledge and experience that they've had. But it's a special gift to bring um, folks in who, this like beautiful, beautiful movements all around the world. And to sort of be connected to those movements and to be able to follow those movements, thanks to Bruce's blog and your work and others, it's, it's just, um, it, one feels very empowered when one is engaged um, in, the, in the process that's happening all around the world. Um, and, and the Global Network has invited many of us to go visit uh, other communities and build relationships there. And that, um, that's our gift. Um, I'm grateful for this organization. Thank you. Sorry, there was no way that somebody was going to talk about unions for that long and you not go crazy. So, um, so quickly, uh, I'm going to say a bunch of things that might be uh, a little controversial. Um, yeah. First is that I'm not a huge fan of mass mobilizations and big marches. Um, the reason that I'm not is because Americans are real romantics about that stuff and look at those things as like the end of the argument and the conversation, and it's not, okay? The real work happens in your communities, in the streets, every single day. Um, and the reality is that most of the organizations that do that work are led by women of color, um, and they are usually young people, and they are usually so underfunded and underappreciated. And every time they get a political win, all the big organizations in town raise their arms of victory and say, we did it. Um, and the reality is that a lot of people on the ground put their blood and their sweat and their tears into this work. And we don't appreciate it because we like the big image. We like the big artwork, we like the protest signs, we like the selfies, we like the moments where we can pat each other on the back and say we did a good job because we were all in the streets together and we were safe. Most protests that I have learned about in history, that you have learned about in history, have always had this element, whether small or large, of danger. Right? The idea that we were really risking something by flexing our muscles together in the streets and doing something together in the streets. So the real question is not whether or not we're going to have a big march. We're going to participate in everything. The People's Climate March, all that stuff. Of course we're going to be there. Of course we're going to be a part of it. That is, that is our responsibility. It's, it's what we're supposed to do. But the real question is what we're going to do every day. Right? What kind of engagement are we going to have every day? And I want to challenge you, just like I, I said in my little speech here, um, I want to challenge you to make it not just the people that agree with you, but the people that don't. And I want you to sit and I want you to listen to them and actually hear where that stuff is coming from. Because the reality is that the real failings of our organizing, the real issues that have struck at the core of what made our institutions weak, what's weakened our unions, what's weakened our, our politics and our practices, what's really weakened those things is the fact that we don't relate to each other as neighbors and we pretend that solidarity stops and ends when we're in the streets marching. So let's do the real work together. Let's widen these rooms and make them colorful and big and loud and noisy and complex, just like we all are. When we do that work, that's when we actually start to win. Thank you for having me up here. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to these wonderful panelists, and thanks to Bruce, and thanks to this organization for putting on this wonderful conference.